Welcome everybody. I'm so excited to be once again doing the annual forecast lecture for the Asheville Friends of Astrology. The saga continues this year. In fact, this year's astrology highlights are continuing developments. Big Change Now is more fully empowered as Pluto locks into Aquarius for almost 20 years. This decade's most important astrology event, a harmonious mini grand trine aspect pattern created by the three outer planets, continues ramping up its power, and the U.S. enters the fourth and final year of its tumultuous Pluto return. Other important continuing stories include Saturn in Pisces and the lunar nodes in Aries and Libra. There's also some new developments involving Jupiter, who's amplifying 2024's astrology energies in various ways. He enters Gemini, conjoins Uranus, and aspects every other slower planet. Jupiter also fires up the outer planet mini grand trine for nearly two months. There is a significant amount of information here that was also in my 2023 full year forecast. This is unavoidable since 2024's big events are continuing from 2023. But if this was a book, you could think of this presentation as a completely revised and updated edition. Even if you recently reviewed my 2023 full year forecast, my hope is that I've included enough new insights and updated information to hold your interest. Before we dive into the forecast, here's a bit about me. I wrote the Amazon number one bestseller called Instant Divine Assistance, Your Complete Guide to Fast and Easy Spiritual Awakening, Healing, and More. I host two podcasts, Awaken, Heal, and Thrive, and the award-winning This Week in Astrology podcast. I run the Awakening Plus online membership, which helps its members awaken, heal, and thrive. I'm a three-time Best Astrologer winner in Western North Carolina's premier reader survey. I've done over 10,000 Astrology Plus shamanic healing and life coaching sessions with a global clientele. I facilitate life-transforming healings and spiritual awakenings in my individual and group sessions and have devoted myself to over 45 years of spiritual practice. My greatest joy is helping others with my free instant divine assistance invocations, which make spiritual awakening, healing, and more fast and easy. My path has included Vipassana Buddhism, Peruvian shamanism, ayahuasca, and San Pedro plant spirit medicine, and those invocations I talked about. All right, let's get into it. I'm going to start with multi-year events. These are these continuing things I was talking about. Pluto in Aquarius. This started back in 2023. Pluto was in Aquarius late March through mid-June. Then he backed into Capricorn for about seven months. In 2024, Pluto returns to Aquarius January 20th through August 31st, then back to Capricorn one more time for two and a half months. Then he'll return to Aquarius on November 19, 2024 through early 2043 for 18 and a half years, roughly. And that means from the time he first went in there, Pluto will be in Aquarius for about 20 years. Also, Uranus carries the same archetypal energy as Aquarius, and Pluto is trine Aquarius most of the time through May 2032. In fact, Pluto is often sesquare Uranus, that's a 135 degree aspect, when it isn't trine. So this kind of doubles down on that 11th archetype, Uranus and Aquarius. Let's go deep on the Pluto archetype. What are the high expressions? Everything in astrology can go high or low. Pluto is death and rebirth. This can be physical, psychological, or shamanic. Pluto is wealth. Of course, that can be money, but wealth is actually anything you value, tangible or intangible. So it's good to define what is the wealth that I want. Pluto is power, and there are two basic kinds of power. There is power over, you keep someone under your thumb, you dominate, you control, you really don't care. People are just collateral to be used to get what you want. And then there's shared power, uh, the kind where you want to be strong so you can help lift others into their power and work for their highest good as well. Pluto rules the occult, which can include astrology, tarot, mediumship, channeling, psychic abilities and such. And occult can, in fact, be 100% love and light. That's the only kind of occult practice I have any interest in. Pluto has a bunch of other qualities, too. It can give you determination, persistence, courage, loyalty, honesty, ambition, discipline, self-reliance, independence, and passion. Pluto is curious. It is the archetype of the detective, the investigator, and the researcher. Pluto is about emotional intensity, caring, protectiveness, and intuition. That's the high stuff. Pluto also, like everything in astrology, has a whole laundry list of low expressions. Dark Pluto can be cruel, sadistic, and violent, as well as dominating, manipulative, and intimidating. 
It can be excessively controlling and authoritarian. Pluto can be jealous, suspicious, and secretive. It can give in to sexual obsession and overindulgence. Finally, it can be vengeful, self-destructive, stubborn, and emotionally excessive or repressed. Whenever an astrological archetype is highlighted, we have the choice individually and collectively about how we activate its light or dark aspects. Earth is a free will zone, and the choice is up to us. As I'll discuss in more detail later, the ways you choose to use the energies of Pluto, Aquarius, and everything else we'll examine will impact how these energies play out on a global scale. All right, now Pluto's in Aquarius, so let's get into that archetype. What's high Aquarius? Aquarius can be progressive. It can be compassionate, justice-focused, freedom-loving, visionary, idealistic, humanitarian, philanthropic, socially engaged, and reform-minded. Aquarius can be ingenious, brilliant, guided by intuitive hits, avant-garde, inquisitive. It can be a big-picture thinker, a problem-solver, can be open-minded, unique, and it loves to serve others with the special talents they most love to use. Finally, Aquarius can be independent, creative, technology-focused, and determined. It is a fixed sign. On the low side, Aquarius can be restless, capricious, unpredictable, unstable, or even insane. It can be defiant, contradictory, and paradoxical. It can settle for external eccentricity instead of expressing its genuine uniqueness. Without intuitive guidance, it can bounce around like a pinball, not staying with anything long enough for meaningful accomplishment. It can lack empathy and be distant, aloof, or robotic, often preferring to be alone. Finally, it can be stubborn and self-righteous. Pluto and Aquarius together. My shorthand for this is big change now. And if you want some sense of what has this been like historically, Pluto's an Aquarius, but as I said earlier, Aquarius and the planet Uranus are the same archetype. And all we have to do is think back to when were Uranus and Pluto conjunct in the 60s. They were exactly conjunct 1964 through 1967, I believe, right in that range. But they were in orb, which means close enough to energize 1960 to 1972. And if you know anything about world history, it wasn't just the US, the whole world was going crazy at that time. There was a lot of really radical stuff happening, some of it wonderful, some of it really horrible. Uh, the high and low were all expressing. So that's probably the most dramatic example of these two archetypes coming together. It was a real shakeup kind of decade. More recently, Uranus and Pluto were square at 90 degree to each other in the mid 2010s. And if you think back to that time, there was a lot of intense stuff happening then as well. Revolutionary change, for better or worse, is what we're looking at with Pluto in Aquarius. So in astrology, we love to say, okay, let's look at what happened the last time we had the same thing happening. And in my last year's forecast lecture, I spent a long time on the two previous Pluto and Aquarius periods. I'm not going to go to that level again, but I do want to give just the cliff notes on what happened the last two times Pluto was in Aquarius. Again, this is highly condensed compared to what I gave you last year. Two cycles ago, 1532 to 1552, Pluto and Aquarius, the Reformation launched Protestantism, posing a radical religious and political challenge to the Catholic Church. Copernicus published On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres, offering mathematical arguments for the existence of the heliocentric universe and denying the geometric model. Heresy! Andreas Vesalius published On the Fabric of the Human Body, revolutionizing the science of human anatomy, all this marked the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the early modern period in Europe, a really big shift. Then after that, Pluto was in Aquarius April 1777 to 1798. Not much happened then. The American Revolutionary War, the Articles of Confederation, the United States Constitution, the French Revolution. Sir William Herschel discovered the planet Uranus, the first of the outer planets to be discovered. Just so happens Uranus is the modern ruling planet of Aquarius. Immanuel Kant published his Critique of Pure Reason, which has exerted an enduring influence on Western philosophy. The book is considered a culmination of several centuries of early modern philosophy and an inauguration of modern philosophy. The beginning of the English Romantic movement in literature was inaugurated by the publication of Lyrical Ballads with a few other poems by William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. This landmark book changed the course of English literature and poetry. 
And in technology, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. The invention of this was momentous, causing massive growth in the production of cotton in the U.S. The cotton gin thus transformed cotton as a crop and the American South into the globe's first agricultural powerhouse. This was a major technological breakthrough, revolutionizing the cotton industry in the United States, but also leading to the growth of slavery in the American South. Whitney's gin made cotton farming more profitable, so plantation owners expanded their plantations and used more enslaved people to pick the cotton. The invention has thus been identified as an inadvertent contributing factor to the outbreak of the American Civil War. Whitney also made another landmark contribution by developing the concept of mass production of interchangeable parts, which of course was helpful in the Industrial Revolution. So, in both Pluto and Aquarius periods, there was major change in many important areas of life. The one happening now could be even more revolutionary, if only because of AI. I'll have more on that soon. Now, Pluto in Capricorn is just ending. I spoke extensively about that last year, and I will not repeat that information here. If you're interested, that section starts at 29 minutes, 9 seconds in my 2023 full year forecast video that's on YouTube. You can go to Benjamin Bernstein podcasts and check that out if you want to learn more about the Pluto and Capricorn period. Now, the following is a fairly brief look at the most important Pluto and Aquarius themes I covered last year, updated to include recent events, the theme of wealth. As Pluto enters Aquarius, the theme of wealth could suffer from unpredictability and sharp spikes up or down. Technology could generate great wealth or decimate it. Take intuitive hits seriously in the area of finance, the most radical intuition I ever ignored. Uh, years ago, about the time the stock market was crashing, I think it was around 2007, 2008, my intuition for the only time in my life woke me up screaming at me and it said, sell your stocks now. <laughs> and I didn't. I was foolish. Three days later, I did sell them. My portfolio had dropped like $30,000. That was a lot of money to me back then. And I have never ignored my intuition ever since then. It knows what it's talking about. So government. The world, sadly, is becoming more authoritarian as autocratic regimes become even more brazen in their repression. Many democratic governments are backsliding and are adopting authoritarian tactics by restricting free speech and weakening the rule of law. Half the democracies in the Americas have suffered democratic erosion, including notable declines in the United States. For much more on this topic, see my 2023 full year forecast video starting at 34 minutes and 36 seconds. In the U.S., the strong Democratic showing in the 2022 midterms with the defeat of most candidates who promoted election denial is a hopeful sign that the U.S. citizenry wants to preserve democracy here. However, right now, our governmental functioning is seriously challenged by conflict within the Republican Party between moderate and radical factions in the U.S. House of Representatives. And a New York Times Siena poll published at the beginning of November 2023, exactly one year before the 2024 presidential election, showed Trump leading Biden in five out of six major battleground states. Trump continues to dominate the GOP primary despite facing four separate criminal indictments. The move to the far right is also strong in Europe. Here are excerpts from a November 24 article in The Guardian titled, Gert Wilder's Victory Confirms Upward Trajectory of Far Right in Europe. Quote, Gert Wilder's shock victory in the Dutch general election confirms the upward trajectory of Europe's populist and far-right parties, which, with the occasional setback, are continuing their steady march into the mainstream. There's now a fair chance that a party shunned by the mainstream for more than a decade because of its radically nativist views could sometime next year join the ranks of the far-right parties advancing across much of Europe, from Helsinki to Rome and Berlin to Brussels. Far-right parties are climbing steadily up the polls, shaping the policies of the mainstream right to reflect their nativist and populist platforms. Analysts note that every far-right party is different, as are the cultures and political systems in which they operate. But across the continent, populist and far-right parties have been rising steadily with the odd interruption for several decades. Almost a third of Europeans now vote for populist, far-right, or far-left parties. Wide support for anti-establishment politics is continuing to surge across the continent and increasingly challenging the mainstream. 
This ends the quotes from that Guardian article. We should also note that in the recent presidential election in Argentina, the radical far-right libertarian Javier Malay scored a decisive victory. So as Pluto moves into Aquarius, you can choose to take whatever action is possible to preserve and promote democracy. Technology. A year ago, the big tech news was the metaverse, but who talks about that anymore? Now, mainly thanks to OpenAI's chat GPT, the focus has shifted decisively to artificial intelligence. In fact, I use chat GPT to generate the image of the three planets for this lecture that you see right behind me. Many experts believe that in 10 years, the rapid evolution of AI could create a world unimaginably different than our current one. We might even have full-blown artificial general intelligence by then. This could become the most transformative technology humanity has ever known, for better or worse. The recent incident at OpenAI with Sam Altman being fired and then rehired as CEO five days later seems to indicate the global powers that be are prioritizing rapid progress over caution. War and violence. Pluto and Aquarius can manifest as large-scale violence. There were major conflicts during the last two Pluto and Aquarius periods, including the Revolutionary War and related conflicts involving France, Spain, and Great Britain, and many European military conflicts during the Reformation. Right now, we have the Russia-Ukraine war grinding on, the recently ignited war between Israel and Hamas, and other conflicts that are not getting as much attention. If you can help resolve a conflict without using violence, this will subtly affect how conflict is handled globally. You can also influence the global energetic network by staying as peaceful as possible yourself and radiating peace, love, and light to the world. You'll notice in this forecast, I'm going to be really big on not what is the world going to do to us, but what can we do to the world? Climate change. In the last year, Cyclone Freddy, the longest lasting recorded tropical cyclone in history, caused over 1,400 deaths in Malawi and Mozambique. Storm Daniel, the deadliest cyclone worldwide since Cyclone Nargis in 2008, killed at least 11,000 people in Libya. In August, because of Canadian wildfires, 68% of the Northwest Territories were forced to evacuate and air quality was seriously compromised in much of North America. 2023 is virtually certain, that's a quote, to be the hottest year in recorded history. The World Meteorological Organization announced yesterday on November 30th at COP28, the United Nations Climate Summit in Dubai. The organization said 2023 has been about 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit above the global average pre-industrial temperature from 1850 to 1990. The past nine years have collectively become the warmest in all 174 years of recorded scientific observations. There is no way around the fact that the ability of Pluto and Aquarius to create shocking, radical, and widespread destruction will be increasingly with us as climate change gets more severe. As much as possible, we would all be wise to move away from areas that could be threatened by extreme weather. Climate change will inevitably lead to widespread relocation of climate refugees, a process that has already started, leading to dramatic demographic changes in countries around the world. All right, everything I've talked about can feel pretty heavy. But as a January 23 post from the Boston Consulting Group notes, there are abundant grounds for optimism. Innovation that's been percolating for years is attracting the investment and nearing the production scale needed to change the game in everything from renewable energy to sustainable agriculture and consumer goods. Stronger government action has ignited a global race to decarbonize emissions-intensive industries. International partnerships are mobilizing to help low-income nations achieve a just energy transition and build more resilient food systems. AI is helping policymakers address complex socioeconomic challenges, and the upheaval in big tech is creating opportunities for talent-starved companies to find the people they need. And a December 2022 New York Times article called Reasons for Optimism in 2023 notes, Wall Street and venture capitalists are bullish on green tech. In his 2022 year-end letter, Bill Gates noted that climate-related R&D has grown nearly a third since the 2015 Paris Accords. Private capital investment in the sector is on the upswing, too, with $70 billion spent in 2021 and 2022. From that, new technologies to address climate issues are continuing to emerge. Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, predicted that venture funding would flow more into startups using hard science to tackle the planet's biggest 
problems. And of course, the thing we don't have statistics on is the spread of spiritual awakening across the planet. What I've seen is a lot more people waking up all across the world from all walks of life. And that, of course, is going to be one of the biggest paradigm shift makers of them all. I'll get into more about that later. Now, one of the meanings of Aquarius is surprise, especially with the breakthroughs that AI will make possible. I fully expect that many of the coming Pluto-powered surprises will be wonderful. All right, so what you're looking at here is a mini grand trine with Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Uranus is the blue guy at the top. Neptune's the green guy at the side. Pluto's the red guy at the bottom. And this is, in my opinion, the most important aspect pattern of the decade. In fact, the most important astrology event of the decade. Let me tell you about it. So this mini grand trine started coming together in 2022. The most recent warm-up connection was June through December 2023. Uh, next, they'll come together April 25th of 2024 through September 6th of 2029. That's for five and a half years. The peak this year in 2024 will be on September 17th. They'll all be together within three degrees. That's a pretty tight orb. Again, orb is meaning how exact is the aspect. Now, this potentially harmonious interaction between the gods of change, each can support the highest qualities of the other. So Pluto, I have already gone deep on Pluto. I covered him when I talked Pluto and Aquarius, but here's a brief recap of his high side potentials. Again, death and rebirth, wealth, power, positive occult practices, determination, persistence, courage, loyalty, honesty, ambition, discipline, self-reliance, independence, passion, curiosity, emotional intensity, caring, protectiveness, and intuition. What about Neptune? Its high side potentials are spiritual awakening, inspired creativity, inspiring others, living in flow state, compassion and unconditional love, conscious unity with all things, conscious dreaming and dream interpretation, empathy, generosity, intuition, sensitivity, compassion, forgiveness, romanticism, and natural healing ability. What about Uranus? Same as the Aquarian energies I also discussed when I interpreted Pluto and Aquarius. Again, here's a recap again of its high side. I'll blow through these pretty quick. Progressive, compassionate, justice-focused, freedom-loving, visionary, idealistic, humanitarian, philanthropic, socially engaged, reform-minded, genius, brilliant, intuitive hits, avant-garde, inquisitive, big-picture thinker, problem-solver, open-minded, unique, serves others with the special talents they most love to use, independent, creative, and technology focused and determined. So each of the three planets potentials is supercharged by the other two. Even with these harmonious aspects though, these planets low potentials are also possible and will almost certainly express to some degree. Now, earlier I mentioned the low side expressions of Pluto and the dark side of Aquarius, which is the same as Uranus's. So I will not repeat those here, but I will fill in the missing piece by describing the low side of Neptune. Neptune can be prone to substance abuse or addiction. It can indulge in excessive escapism or aimless drifting, and it can fall into the role of the victim or martyr. I like to say, what's the martyr with you? Neptune can also be pessimistic, lazy, gullible, and indecisive. Finally, it can be secretive, deceptive, passive-aggressive, or moody. All three outers are moving into new signs, and we'll touch into them by early July of 2025. All will firmly settle into their new signs by late April of 2026. All these new signs will be air or fire, which is more masculine and assertive. Pluto is already in and out of Aquarius, as we've discussed. Neptune enters Aries at the end of March 2025, then locks in in late January of 2026. In a nutshell, Neptune in Aries adds drive, passion, fire, and initiation around all the Neptune high side potentials, including spiritual awakening. Uranus enters Gemini in early July of 2025, then locks in in late April of 2026. Uranus entering Gemini supports brilliant breakthrough thinking, which is exactly what humanity needs to get through the huge challenges we're facing. In fact, that might be symbolic of what AI is going to be doing. So is this mini grand trine a uh, harbinger of a new age of love and light? Is this the Aquarian age, the fifth density thing we've all been waiting for? And is Earth even designed for that? Now, I'm of two minds about this. Part of me really wants that to be true. I'd love to have something like a utopia paradise right here on this 3D physical Earth. 
However, the law of one channel material has a different opinion. They say Earth isn't designed for that. You have to have conflict here for Earth to serve its function. We are not the end of the line here. Earth is like level three of seven total levels. And even after we graduate being human, we still have billions of years of evolution after that in higher levels and dimensions. And we're on Earth, the law of one says, to make a conscious choice. We're either service to self or service to other. Service to other, that means we're at least 51% concerned about others versus ourselves. Uh, service to self, you got to be at least 95% self-centered to graduate that way. So I don't know which is true, whether, you know, one philosophy is all humans are just fundamentally good at the core. And if we're behaving badly, it's because we're wounded or traumatized. I'd love to think that way. But law of one says, no, actually about 10% of us are deliberately choosing that dark path. And that is what we are here for. And I don't know which is true, but I do know if you are on the path of love and light, which I'm guessing most of the folks watching this are, then the same path will apply either way, whichever those philosophies you believe. Basically, if you step onto your own path of healing and awakening and become the brightest, most conscious being that you can, that will radiate out of the collective and help uplift us. And whether earth is designed to be a paradise or not, that will be good for you and good for everybody. So whichever you believe, I think the same uh, path forward will serve either way. Again, everything I give here is my opinion. So this is Jupiter square Pluto. So this was in orb for about four months in 2023. It remains in orb through February 2024. Jupiter Pluto is amplified power for good or ill, increased wealth, boosted sexuality, possibly including soul blended sacred sex, religious empowerment, ability to do or overdo more, enthusiasm or fanaticism, life transforming insights, amplified power to serve others, increased wealth used to benefit others, foreign wars, we've certainly got that going on, increased passion for higher learning, more energy for quests and adventures, and epic celebration, euphoria, and enthusiasm. Here we've got uh, Saturn in Pisces. So Saturn in Pisces, he went into Pisces on March 7 of 2023. He'll stay there through May 24th of 2025. That's over two years. So let's think about the keywords for these guys. Saturn keywords are mature, responsible, productive, good time management, plan the work and work the plan, the wise elder, the hermit, death, challenge, reality checks, and the phrase, the obstacle is the way. Pisces keywords are spiritual awakening, inspired creativity, flow state, dreams, visions. And again, the low side, as I said earlier, substance abuse, addiction, excessive escapism, aimless drifting, or playing the victim. So when you put Saturn in Pisces, it revs up certain possibilities. The law of attraction, turning dreams and visions into reality. This is because Pisces is good for visualizing and imagining, and Saturn is good for crystallizing things into physical form. It's also really good for embodied awakening, which is my favorite kind. I'm not interested in a space out awakening where I can't function. I want my higher self and my spiritual juju right here in my body so I can use it in my human life. So in this context, Neptune is spiritual awakening and Saturn says it's crystallized into physical form. Also, a third way to use a Saturn in Pisces is conscious dissolution. Neptune can dissolve stuff away too. And if there's stuff you do not need in your life anymore, you can ask Neptune, hey, uh, I got this Saturn structure down here. Would you please dissolve it away so I can make room for something better? Also, uh, Saturn in Pisces is good for creative accomplishment. Uh, pitfalls, though, can be using escapism to avoid challenges, using an abundance of ideas as an excuse not to act on any of them, excessive isolation, or repressing spiritual awakening or inspired creativity. Okay, this is the lunar nodes coming into Aries and Libra. And they did that on July 17 of 2023. So, all right. So uh, this is on for 18 months. Again, it, as I said, it happened on July 17, 2023. Uh, they'll stay in these signs through January 11, 2025. There's more than one way to calculate the nodes. I am using a true node calculation. So with the North node in Aries and the South node in Libra, we're called to have appropriate balance between self and others enlightened selfishness, assertively promoting your creativity, proactively initiating relationships, 
pursuing the path of the warrior, entrepreneur, initiator, or sexual being while maintaining harmony, balance, and consideration for others. Jupiter in Taurus. Okay, Jupiter came into Taurus on May 16, 2023, and it will stay there through May 25th of 2024. That's just over a year. This is an expansion of Taurus themes. Those include money, material possessions, the five senses and sensuality, persistence, nature immersion, just being. The downside can be the devil I know is better than the devil I don't know, or boring yourself to death. Uh, let's talk about the Jupiter archetype. Jupiter can be standing in for higher education, formal or self-guided as a student, being the professor, philosopher, guru, or other wisdom giver, foreign cultures and countries, religion, philosophy, and the meaning of life, quests and adventures, celebration, euphoria, and enthusiasm. Its dark qualities can be overextension or believing you have the one true way you're right and everybody else is wrong. Jupiter in Taurus can help you with practical idealism, higher education with practical applications, euphoric sensuality, but there is a danger of getting stuck in those dark side expressions over extension or thinking you have the one true way. So those are the carryovers, things that started before 2024 and carry into the year. Now we're going to go chronologically with things actually happening fully in 2024. Pluto does enter Aquarius for the second time in January 20 of 2024. This slide I just brought up is a lunar eclipse on March 25th of 2024. There's four eclipses in 2024. I'm going to show you them all. But this one is nothing special. Actually, if you look here, there's nothing especially notable here. The luminaries are not that close to the nodes. There's no really special strong aspects. So I just wanted to note that is probably the least powerful of all the eclipses we're having this year. But the next eclipse, this is a solar eclipse, April 8, 2024 at 19 Aries. Uh, check this out. How often do you get a planet exactly conjunct the sun and moon? Look at that. Sun, moon, and Chiron at exactly the same degree number, 19 degrees, 24 minutes Aries. And also there's this T-square, the sun, moon, and Chiron, and the nodes are opposing the south node in their square series. The series and Chiron have something in common. They're both shadow work and healing indicators. Ceres, also known as Demeter, in her mythological story, her daughter Persephone was abducted by Pluto, taken down to the underworld. And so Ceres mourned inconsolably until they worked out a resolution to that. Um, Chiron is the wounded healer archetype. And uh, Chiron is the single thing I use that is the most about trauma healing and working through that. So this solar eclipse here on April 8th, powerful time to really focus on shadow work and healing or taking the car into the high side, you stepping out as a healer or wisdom giver. Now, the thing about eclipses is a standard newer full moon lasts a couple of weeks, but eclipses are good for at least six months. So when eclipse hits, you can work its themes for a long time. Next, the tiniest slide of them all, <laughs> Jupiter conduct Uranus. Uh, this happens on April 20th of 2024. It's a 22 Taurus. And the orb of this conjunction is four months. They get close enough to activate February 16 of 2024. And they leave orb June 16 of 2024. So basically mid-February through mid-June. All right. So what follows is an extensive list of shadow qualities between Jupiter and Uranus and or Aquarius followed by lots of positive qualities. Most of these are drawn with the author's generous permission from Ren Butler's magnificent book. It's called The Archetypal Universe, Astrological Patterns in Human Culture, Thought, Emotion, and Dreams. Shadow qualities, manic and impulsive, excesses, going too far, intolerance of any level of structure or commitment, unrealistic urges for freedom outweighing everything else, unwillingness to cooperate, flippant arrogance, unbridled eccentricity, unreliable and impractical nature, ongoing wanderlust and impatience, irresponsible or ineffective rebellion, shallow or incomplete rebirth, false breakthroughs, flash in the pan delusions, an attraction to get rich quick schemes, pie in the sky over optimism, fool's gold, a potential for hubris and overweening pride, a Christ complex, cravings for glory, delusions of genius, philosophical conflicts, philosophical or intellectual elitism, 
or self-righteous genius. Thank God there's also a bunch of upside to Jupiter and Uranus together, including breakthroughs in understanding the meaning of life, innovative religious practices, breaking out of your ruts to live life as an adventurous quest, learning new and unusual things that add significant meaning to your life, more openness to foreign teachings and influences, more international travel, sharing your innovative insights with others, breaking through to more joy, exuberance, euphoria, and celebration, more wisdom gained through intuitive hits, expanding into your authentic self, whether that's human or divine, more expansion into serving your kindred spirits with your special gifts and talents you most love to use, dramatic breakthroughs and quantum leaps, rebirth and awakening, surprising resolution of problems, we'll take that, unexpected openings and opportunities, expanded horizons, changes of fortune or philosophy, incurable and infectious optimism, heightened aliveness, access to new layers or realms of experience, transcendence of petty problems and attachments, urges to share your light, the light at the end of the tunnel, the eureka moment, feelings of universal redemption, collective epiphanies and awakenings, breakthroughs that benefit everybody, everything around you coming vibrantly alive, higher emancipation, freedom for all, maximum liberation, moments of genius or brilliance, divine inspiration, creative frenzy to become as a god, flashes of greatness, ascendancy of the liberal humanitarian and progressive impulses, and surges of cultural flowering. Whew, it's a lot. Because this conjunction is in Taurus, any of the above can be integrated into a routine and done consistently. Taurus also can help any of these possibilities be brought into concrete physical manifestation. Next, this is the mini grand trine I talked about earlier with Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. But look at the top, Jupiter is up there with Uranus. I was just talking about that conjunction. As it so happens, Jupiter gets close enough to fire up all the planets in that mini grand trine April 25th through June 16th. His version of the mini grand trine peaks on May 18th. And basically, this just amplifies the power of that mini grand trine with the three outer planets. It ends at the same time as the mini grand trine does. We also have Jupiter sextile Neptune. This is on May 23rd. All these dates are 2024. Jupiter's at 29 Taurus. Neptune's at 29 Pisces. This sextile is in orbit for two and a half months, mid-April through late June. This harmonious aspect supports many wonderful things, including spiritual teachings, religious practices focused on direct personal enlightenment, deeply enhanced flow states, easy access to spiritual awakening, deeply enhanced divine inspiration and creative inspiration, expanding your inner artistry, gaining wisdom from dreams, and gaining deep insight from your inner wisdom. But this also has darker possibilities. Jupiter could expand Neptune's potential for addiction, substance abuse, or excessive escapism, avoid aimless wandering or martyring yourself in a relationship. There is expanded potential for confusion, delusion, and deception, so watch out for false teachings. Reality check ideas with your inner guidance if you can access it. Otherwise, vet them however you can to avoid getting sucked into a compelling falsehood. There's a lot of those around these days. Just look on social media. The four core questions from the work of Byron Katie are especially helpful during this conjunction. Is this true? Can you absolutely know that it's true? How do you react when you believe that thought? What happens? And who would you be without that thought? Can you hold all beliefs as conditional and potentially subject to revision or replacement? I find this to be a very helpful policy for myself. As I once heard another astrologer say, realism is trapped imagination. Focus on what you want as Jupiter sextiles Neptune, and this aspect can help you make it real. This is even easier because Jupiter is in Taurus, creating a lovely law of attraction energy. Neptune rules imagination and visualization. Jupiter rules luck and expansion. And Taurus loves to bring things into physical manifestation. If we think of Neptune representing spiritual awakening, the setup also supports embodied awakening. Jupiter enters Gemini. This happens on May 25th, 2024. Jupiter will stay in the sign of the twins until he enters Cancer just over a year later on June 9th, 2025. This is a wonderful placement for communication. 
Gemini rules learning, writing, and teaching, and has endless curiosity about everything. Jupiter has greater interest in more specialized wisdom and can present as the professor, philosopher, guru, or other giver of wisdom. Jupiter also rules publication, which these days could also represent print, audio, video, or even virtual reality. Jupiter in Gemini might also inspire you to explore new cultures and countries, explore novel philosophies or religions, or get more curious about the meaning of life. Jupiter trine Pluto. This happens on June 2nd, 2024. Jupiter, two degrees Gemini, Pluto, two degrees Aquarius. And this trine is in orb for almost three months, April 22nd through July 14th. The most obvious effect of Jupiter trine Pluto is for Pluto's power to supercharge all of Jupiter's possibilities. I mentioned these earlier, but that was far enough back in this presentation that I'll mention Jupiter's core meetings again. High side, higher education, formal or self-guided as a student, professor, philosopher, guru, or other wisdom giver, foreign cultures and countries, religion, philosophy, and the meaning of life, quest and adventures, celebration, euphoria, and enthusiasm, low side, overextension, and thinking you have the one true way. Pluto also empowers all the Jupiter and Gemini possibilities I just mentioned. Jupiter also amplifies all of Pluto's potentials. I've spent a lot of time on those already, so I will not repeat those here. Finally, Jupiter and Pluto are a classic wealth combination. Their trine could make it easier to generate more wealth, whether you define that as money or something else. Just remember that trines give a certain amount for free, but you have to use effort or mine the trine to extract its greatest potential. Now, we have the mini grand trine with Mars. Mars is the red guy up there at the top next to Uranus. And Mars fires up the mini grand trine from July 9th to July 31st, his strongest interaction on July 19th. And basically Mars simply adds energy to the mini grand trine with the three outer planets. Next up, a full moon on July 21st, 2024. I only have uh, just two or three lunations that are not eclipses when they're really notable. And this one I wanted to note because it's one of 2024's most powerful full moons. It expands the mini grand trine with the three outer planets with Mars to a cradle aspect pattern. And it even throws in a T-square with the luminaries Chiron and Pluto. So that is a powerhouse lunation. Very powerful for anything you want to do with the outer planets or good healing or mentoring or work of that nature. Lots more too, but again, this is a full year forecast. So I can only say a little bit about any lunation while we're here. Then Jupiter square Saturn on August 19, Jupiter 17 Gemini, Saturn 17 Pisces. This square is in orb for more than a year from July 6, 2024 through July 31st, 2025. In fact, there will be two more exact squares, December 24th of 2024 and June 9th of 2025. Astrology divides planets into three major categories, personal, social, and outer Jupiter and Saturn are the only social planets and are complementary opposites. Jupiter expands, Saturn contracts. Jupiter is adventurous, Saturn is conservative and cautious. Jupiter loves to explore foreign lands and cultures, while Saturn prefers to stick with the traditions and conventions it already knows. So, as Jupiter and Saturn spend more than a year squaring each other, you may feel such conflicting urges arise within you. Neither one is right or wrong. They're more like the eternal yin and yang dancing with each other. Since both polarities are needed, the trick is to get good at dancing. Jupiter is in Gemini and Saturn is in Pisces. This is great for establishing a regular routine for inspired writing, teaching, or any type of communication. It's also ideal for religious studies or channeling. On September 1st, Pluto retrogrades back into Capricorn. All right, this is a lunar eclipse on September 17. Moon's at 26 Pisces. And I just brought this one up because once again, we have a lunation aligning with the three outer planets and their mini grand trine. Anytime we have anything firing that up, whether it's a lunation, Mars, Jupiter, any significant point lining up, it just juices the power up of that mini grand trine that I've already talked about. In fact, not only is the Pisces lunar eclipse on September 17. That is also the day when the mini grand trine hits its 2024 peak. 
This is its closest approach so far, and the three outer planets are less than three degrees apart. So that is plenty tight enough to be really active and making a difference. We've also got a solar eclipse on October 2nd. That's at 10 degrees Libra. And once again, I brought this up. It's close to the nodes. It's tightly conjunct Mercury. And there's also a tight uh, square 135 degrees to Uranus. So this solar eclipse, of course, it is in Libra. That's great for new beginnings in relating or creating. Mercury says you can communicate, learn, teach. So that's really supercharged. And the Uranus, 135 degree Uranus is down there in the lower right, the blue guy. We've already talked about him. You know, become conventional, follow your intuitive hits, serve others with your special gifts and talents you love to use. All that is really brought in very powerfully. And Uranus hitting all those other planets says, you know, really step into your uniqueness, relate in the unique way, uh, create in your unique way, communicate, write, teach in your unique way. All that stuff is pretty strongly emphasized by that solar eclipse. We have Jupiter sextile Chiron. This is on October 12th. Jupiter 21 Gemini, Chiron 21 Aries. This is in orb August 7th of 2024 through January 27th of 2025. And the sextile will happen again on November 2nd of 2024. It's in orb again, actually in 2025, early March through late June, with its final exact hit on May 18th of 2025. So what does it mean? Would you enjoy amplified opportunities for healing and mentoring? How about easier shadow work? They're all on the table with Jupiter sextile Chiron. This is a soft aspect, but don't be surprised if it still stirs up some unpleasant emotions. If you repress these disturbing feelings, it only guarantees that they will reemerge later. Instead, do effective shadow work to permanently clear those old wounds. This sextile can also help you take your abilities as a healer and mentor to the next level. Jupiter rules foreign lands, so stay open to techniques from other countries and cultures. All right, next we have a cradle. This again is the mini grand trine, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, Mars at a fourth corner. This cradle uh, comes into orb October 10th, peaks on October 29th, and ends on November 15th. And once again, it's just firing up that mini grand trine again because Mars is energizing it. This is Jupiter sextile Chiron again. That's November 2nd. I told you that'd be coming. That's Jupiter at 20 Gemini, Chiron at 20 Aries, the second of the three sextiles with these planets. The interpretation is the same as before. Then we've got a full moon on November 15th, the moon at 24 Taurus. Again, energizing the outer planets mini grand trine. As you can see, all three of those outer planets are aspecting that full moon on November 15th. Then on November 19th, Pluto finally settles into Aquarius for the long haul. As I mentioned earlier, from this point, Pluto will remain in Aquarius through March 8 of 2043, about 18 and a half years from this moment and about 20 years since his first entry. Then we have Jupiter square Saturn on December 24th. Uh, Jupiter 14 Gemini, Saturn 14 Pisces. This is the second of the three Jupiter Saturn squares. Its interpretation is the same one I gave for its first occurrence on August 19th. And then we have one final event that actually peaks in 2025, but it starts this year. This is a mystic rectangle. It has trines and sextiles on the outside and a couple of oppositions pulling it together. This is with Mars, Neptune, Pluto, and the lunar nodes. It's in orb for three months. It comes together October 30th, peaks on January 8th of 2025, and ends on January 27th of 2025. This powerful and harmonious aspect pattern can give you plenty of power to accomplish your life purpose. Mars and Pluto provide plenty of fuel, while Neptune can give you a steady flow of intuitive guidance. With Neptune conjunct the North Node, also known as the Destiny Point, it's an especially good time to focus on life purpose themes that relate to spiritual awakening, expressing your inspired creativity, or operating more consistently in flow state. Next up, the U.S. Pluto return. So if you're seeing the graphic, uh, the little circle in the lower left, um, this is the natal chart of the United States. This is the most commonly used natal chart for the U.S., July 4, 1776, 5.10 p.m., Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 
And what you're seeing down there, the, the planets floating around the outside are the transiting planets. The planets inside the circle are the natal chart. And as you can see down there, transiting Pluto is on top of natal Pluto. And it takes like 250 years, roughly, for this to come back. So uh, people don't get Pluto returns, but countries do. This Pluto return was exact three times. Pluto landed on its own position on February 21st of 2022, July 11 of the same year, and then once again on December 28th of 2022, but it's still in orb. In fact, uh, it came into orb on March 13th of 2020, and it will still be close enough to be firing it up through December 14th of 2024. That's about four years for that conjunction. So I've already given you the Pluto keywords. I'm not going to repeat those. And I'll talk about these a little bit, but I also have a big yellow thing on the outside at the bottom is a green planet Chiron. And during the Pluto return, the U.S. is also having its Chiron return, May 2023 through March 2025. And that transiting Chiron is opposite natal Saturn up near the top. And that is June 2021 through February 2024. So it's not just a Pluto return. Chiron transiting is doing some major stuff as well. So now what I'm going to give you is a concise overview of what's happened in the U.S. during the Pluto returns. So get ready for a little bit of Wayback Machine here. What's been going on starting in 2020? In that year, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, U.S. life expectancy fell by over a year in 2020, and unemployment rates rose to the worst rates since the Great Depression. There's the theme of death. There's the theme of financial collapse, all Pluto themes. The May 2020 murder of George Floyd, death, caused mass protests and riots in many major cities over police brutality, with many states calling in the National Guard. This was Donald Trump's final full year as president, his term ended with the appointment of three conservative justices to the Supreme Court, cementing a conservative majority. There was a rise in domestic terrorist threats and widespread conspiracy theories around mail-in voting and COVID-19. COVID-19, there were over a million deaths in the U.S. during COVID-19. Uh, that's also mass death, a Pluto theme. The QAnon conspiracy theory gained publicity and multiple major cities were hit by rioting and brawls between far-left anti-fascist affiliated groups and far-right groups like the Proud Boys. We had Trump's first impeachment trial. Trump lost the 2020 election, but claimed a stolen victory. Vice President Kamala Harris made history as the first female Black and South Asian vice president, and Republican-led states across the U.S. began sweeping rollbacks of LGBT rights. That's 2020. 2021, a huge Pluto theme, the January 6th insurrection. Uh, usually when a country has a Pluto return, often the government changes, and that nearly happened here. The possible death of the country itself or the death and rebirth uh, almost happened there on January 6th. Trump tried to overturn the 2020 election results throughout the year. We had Trump's second impeachment, the first ever for a U.S. president. There were protests against COVID-19 lockdowns, other ongoing protests, mostly against police brutality, an extremely active Atlantic hurricane season, a destructive California wildfire season, U.S. life expectancy decreased by around half a year, more death. The U.S. military mission in Afghanistan formally ended. Biden signed into law the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, a $1.9 trillion stimulus bill that temporarily established expanded unemployment insurance and sent $1,400 stimulus checks to most Americans in response to continued economic pressure from COVID-19. He also signed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, a 10-year plan brokered by Biden alongside Democrats and Republicans in Congress to invest in American roads, bridges, public transit, ports, and broadband access. 2022, last year. Culture wars, including critical race theory and the teaching of gender identity in schools. On June 24th, the Supreme Court, in a landmark ruling, determined that abortion is not a protected right under the Constitution. The ruling sparked protests across the country and the themes of death, control, Ongoing investigations into Trump in the January 6th attack, a global inflation surge, more big money stuff, with repeated Federal Reserve interest rate hikes, stock market decline and higher gas prices, all partly due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. 
huge layoffs at America's largest tech companies. Katanji Brown Jackson is the first black woman confirmed as a Supreme Court justice. Hurricane Ian became the deadliest hurricane to hit the U.S. since Hurricane Katrina in 2005. There were hundreds of mass shootings. The United States recorded its highest actual number of suicides ever in 2022, with over 49,000 people taking their own lives. This was the deadliest suicide rate in the country since World War II. We had the cryptocurrency collapse, another major money thing. Elon Musk's actions after purchasing Twitter resulted in rampant chaos and confusion. The Democrats surprised everybody by maintaining control of the U.S. Senate and holding back a red wave in the House. Polls showed strong voter concern over abortion access and an existential threat to democracy. Trump announced another run for the presidency. Biden proposed a significant expansion of the U.S. social safety net through the Build Back Better Act. But those efforts, along with voting rights legislation, failed in Congress. However, in August 2022, Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, a domestic appropriations bill that included some of the provisions of Build Back Better after that entire bill failed to pass. This included significant federal investment in climate and domestic clean energy production, tax credits for solar panels, electric cars, and other home energy programs, as well as a three-year extension of the Affordable Care Act. From June 2022, Biden scored a string of legislative achievements with the signing of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the Chips and Science Act, a massive investment in the semiconductor industry and manufacturing, the Honoring Our Pact Act to support veterans who were exposed to toxic substances during military service, expansion of veterans' health care and the Respect for Marriage Act, repealing the Defense of Marriage Act, and codifying same-sex and interracial marriage. Now we're on to 2023. I found this really interesting because, you know, we've been so deep. It's like we forgot all this crazy stuff that was happening in recent years. What happened in this year, 2023? We had a decline in severity of the COVID-19 pandemic, who ended its global health emergency status in May. We did have a banking crisis, more Pluto theme. Numerous American regional banks collapsed. The two largest were First Republic Bank and Silicon Valley Bank, the second and third largest banking collapses in U.S. history. We had the continued rise of generative AI models with increasing applications across various industries. These models, leveraging advancements in machine learning and natural language processing, have become capable of creating realistic and coherent text, images, and music. An AI arms race between private companies has continued since the late 2010s with Microsoft-backed OpenAI and Google-owned Alphabet most dominant. The debate over abortion has continued, with numerous laws being passed by state legislatures and court decisions issued at all levels. 2021's inflation surge moderated in 2023, while the Federal Reserve continued to raise interest rates in the first half of the year. The rise of artificial intelligence and large language models dominated not only the economy, but was also at the root of a Hollywood double strike conducted by the Writers Guild of America and the SAG-AFTRA Actors Union. These were part of a larger phenomenon of labor strikes across the country in which diverse groups such as Teamsters and auto workers won new contracts. Again, power being gained by the workers, another Pluto theme. Additionally, the latter half of the year saw many large mergers and acquisitions. This is like the big money power control part of Pluto. Some of the largest announcements being in oil and gas with ExxonMobil's purchase of Pioneer Natural Resources for nearly $60 billion dollars and Chevron's acquisition of Hess Corporation for $50 billion, both pending regulatory approval. Mass shootings in 2023 have continued in high numbers, one of the darker Pluto themes. As of November 8th, the U.S. experienced 25 weather and climate disasters, which caused at least $1 billion in damage each. Politically, for the first time in over 99 years, a Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives was not determined by an initial vote, After four days and 15 ballots, Representative Kevin McCarthy was elected. Ten months later, he became the only speaker ever to be removed from the position following a motion to vacate. Mike Johnson was elected as new speaker on October 25th after two other speaker candidates failed to win election. It remains to be seen if he can appease the conflicting factions he faces more skillfully than McCarthy. And that's all power politics thing. That's Pluto stuff, too. In August, Fitch Ratings downgraded its U.S. debt rating from AAA to AA+, citing, quote, deteriorating standard of governance, end quote. August 14th, Trump was indicted in Atlanta on 13 counts, including racketeering for his attempt to overturn 
President Biden's victory in Georgia during the 2020 election. Again, limits to power. August 20th, Hurricane Hillary made landfall in Southern California, causing widespread flooding and thousands of power outages, making it the first major tropical storm to impact the region and the first to strike California since 1939. On August 30th, Hurricane Idalia made landfall with 125 mile per hour winds. It was the first major hurricane on record to impact the Big Bend of Florida. Just recently, on November 17, Sam Altman, the co-founder and CEO of ChatGPT developer OpenAI, was fired by OpenAI's board for reportedly lying to its board of directors, but he was reinstated five days later after OpenAI investor Microsoft announced its intention to hire Altman and any other OpenAI employee who wanted to join them, spurring a potential mass exodus of most OpenAI staff. I heard it was about 95% of them were ready to leave. This is widely viewed as an indication that speed of development, as I said earlier, will trump safety concerns in the future of AI development. So that's what you get with a Pluto return, turbulent times, powerful things happening that can be challenging, that can also be wonderful. As I mentioned earlier, the U.S. is having its car in return. That lasts May 2023 through March 2025. So we're still in that right now. And Chiron has been opposing Saturn. That started June 2021. That will last through February 2024. The themes of these guys are wounding, trauma, and healing. And again, our country has had a tremendous amount of wounding, a lot of trauma going on. And that is just kind of the theme with Pluto on Pluto and Chiron landing on itself and opposing Saturn. So it's an intense time for sure. So the power theme, I already talked about service to self versus a service to other. This is one of the themes we're all being asked to look at, the themes of wealth, uh, death and rebirth transformation. So I want to talk now about the importance of maintaining embodied awakening as strongly and consistently as possible. So at first, what follows may seem like an unrelated spiritual tangent to this presentation, but I will tie all this back into the astrology. So if you can hold dual consciousness, including and in transcending human consciousness in the world, but not of it, this is really helpful in dealing with what we're going through now. If you can hold the paradox that follows from a cosmic level, the earth and anything that happens on it is an insignificant blip in a vast universe. At the same time, your life and how you live it is of the utmost importance or divine consciousness would not have bothered to manifest it. All this can seem like nonsense until you've reached a certain level of awakening, after which it becomes clear. If you don't resonate with this idea, think of the principle of as within, so without. I experienced this principle myself and have had it confirmed by hundreds of friends and clients. The best way to shift your external physical reality is to proactively shift your own consciousness. The more you hold a particular vibration within yourself, the more the universe will reflect it back to you through your experiences in the world. The more you cultivate the peace and equanimity of embodied awakening within yourself, the more peaceful your daily life will become. However, this will not stop your higher self from giving you appropriate challenges to deepen your awakening. These challenges typically are designed to stir up unhealed emotional wounds and traumas within you. These block your deeper awakening. My image of this is called the great onion of consciousness, which I describe in my book. The idea is you have a higher self, one level up, it's way more awakened than your human self is. And the reason your human self isn't getting more of that awakening is there's like dark onion layers around the onion. And each of these layers is an old wound or trauma that was unhealed either from this lifetime or from a past life. So every time you do a good piece of shadow work and you peel off one of those layers and you heal the trauma once and for all, it reveals more of that divine light to shine down to you. So for most people in my experience, years of working with people on this, for most people, the fastest road to spiritual awakening is good shadow work, do good trauma healing. I believe that since we live in an infinite universe, there are infinite levels of spiritual awakening. That's why I've adopted the motto, it always gets better than this. Until you're ready for your next awakening, you may not even be aware of the heavy energy that must be cleared to get access to it. Once you have cleared that layer of heavy energy, you automatically open to the next awakening in line. Each awakening is more wonderful than the previous, and each one is a complete surprise. They're beyond language, but can most definitely be felt and embodied. If you focus on embodied awakening, each awakening not only makes your human experience more wonderful and ecstatic, 
but also boost your practical mastery of life in every conceivable way. Even if you are not mystically inclined, constantly deepening your embodied awakening can be worthwhile simply for its practical daily benefits. For example, you can save a huge amount of time by enhancing your intuition, by being more awake, since this lets you make decisions much more quickly. You just know what to do without having to think about it. Also, everything you are responsible for, you can do more responsibly and more joyfully. And the ability to shift increasingly from mental and emotional turbulence to more consistent and ever-deepening states of harmony, flow, ease, and grace will dramatically enhance your quality of life right here on Earth. Fortunately, clearing these old traumas can be surprisingly quick and easy. There are many effective techniques for this accelerated healing journey. One technique which I was given by divine inspiration more than 12 years ago is the healing invocation. If you're interested, you can learn more about it for free by going on my website. Go to astroshaman.com slash invocations. I cover this healing invocation in much greater detail, along with several other life-transforming invocations in my book, as I mentioned earlier, it's called Instant Divine Assistance, Your Complete Guide to Fast and Easy Spiritual Awakening, Healing, and More. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and hardcover on Amazon, and as an audiobook on Audible. I even narrate. Another resource that can help you awaken, heal, and thrive is my online membership. It's called Awakening Plus. Awakening Plus events range from bubble bath gentle to shamanically intense. They support your individual healing and awakening, as well as global spiritual awakening. We also have community-focused events where you can ask questions and connect with other members. Hundreds of satisfied members make up our supportive online community. Would it be a good fit for you? By joining, you would receive these exclusive benefits. At least nine of our monthly Zoom events are members only. Some members attend lots of live events, while some don't do any. Many members prefer to experience our events when it's best for them, choosing from an archive of over 600 life-transforming experiences. Amazingly, the recorded events are just as powerful as the live ones. We even have a best of guide, which helps you quickly and easily choose the events that are best for you. We have several courses. One's called Instant Divine Assistance, Fast and Easy Awakening and Healing. Another, Self-Guided Internal Family Systems Therapy. A third, Your Divine Allies, Let Them Help You More. We have a Members Helping Members Service. You can pair up with an accountability partner. You get constant support from the Awakening Plus group energy field and much more. If you're interested, check out awakeningplus.com. That's awakeningplus.com. Now, I promised you that I would tie all this back into the astrology. Let's do that with the idea of Indra's web. A related idea is the butterfly effect. Your consciousness and actions radiate out and affect all other beings. There's a whole spectrum of possibilities between being the pawn being moved on the chessboard and being the chess master moving the pieces. The more deeply you awaken, the more you become the chess master. The more deeply you awaken, the more you can help Pluto's transit of Aquarius to bring the radical changes that will best serve all beings on Earth. The more deeply you awaken, the more likely you make it that the mini grand trine with the three outer planets will awaken the most life-affirming energies of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto to support and uplift us. The more deeply you awaken, the more you'll be able to work with all of 2024's astrological events and every astrological event thereafter in a way that serves the highest good of all. You do not have to be a Gandhi, a Nelson Mandela, or a Martin Luther King Jr. to positively affect the world. There are a massive number of light workers on the planet right now, and many hands make light work. If you've already awakened deeply enough, you already have the necessary intuitive guidance to do your part. If not, once you heal and awaken enough, your intuition will come online and keep you aligned with your soul mission. And you'll be able to work with the astrological influences of 2024 or any other year in a more magnificent way than you ever thought possible. As we close, let me encourage you to read or listen to my book. Just search for Instant Divine Assistance on Amazon. Check out my two podcasts, Awaken, Heal, and Thrive, and This Week in Astrology, and my Awakening Plus online membership at awakeningplus.com. All right, let me once again thank the Asheville Friends of Astrology for hosting this presentation. There is plenty of time for questions. Gina says, anything suggesting tech and climate ideologies agendas will collapse by the end of 2024? The times we're in with Pluto and Aquarius, there can be radical collapse of just about anything. 
Again, it's what we make it. I'm not one who's going to predict what's going to happen. There are too many possibilities, in my opinion. And uh, we live in a vast web of possibilities where the most wonderful or terrible things are all in the realm of possibility. My hope is that the world will get more serious. You know, I have seen, you know, time and again, we go to the, the COP conference each year and, you know, countries are pledging that they'll do all these things and then they don't or they fall short. We're already in increasing climate change challenges. Um, I'm I'm hoping, of course, that as the the crises get more serious, that the countries will take them more seriously and realize, wow, to saving the planet is a little more important than the economy, and we'll make that appropriate focus. Um, but again, I just I can't pretend to predict what's going to happen on that. Uh, my main message here with you guys is we are the ones whose influence will affect that. I realize we're not, most of us in the government, we're not the big decision makers for these things, but holding the vision of what we want, holding the highest vibration we personally can hold, that radiates out that good energy to the world and makes it a little more likely that a harmonious outcome will happen. I have a little more on that, but let me just see what this person, uh, Missy, said. Thank you for offering this and thank you, Benjamin, for sharing your overview. I look forward to seeing the recording since this was a lot of information. And it's been a superb reminder to live in light and share light to attract light. Thank you. I appreciate that idea, Missy. I have a philosophy, uh, and I did a recent podcast on this in my Awaken Home and Thrive podcast series called What is Mine to Do? There's a lot of light workers on the planet, and none of us individually can solve all the big major crises I've been talking about. But if each of us just awakens enough, like I was saying near the end of the presentation, to just get your own inner guidance. If the numbers I'm hearing are correct, there are over a billion light workers on the planet right now. A huge percentage of the population are here to help out and hold high vibration. And each one, if you get intuitively open enough, then your higher self, the 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 divine intelligence that's available here can give you suggestions on what to do. It won't command you because we have free will and the, the path of love and light does not command. It just offers opportunities. And once you get a sense of, oh, my intuition is suggesting I go do this thing. And if enough of us are open and following that inner guidance, then we can synchronistically go into play and get a lot of really amazing good work done. And a lot of very positive change can come from that. And in my opinion, it's a lot more likely that the good things are going to happen because of that synchronistic inner guidance from more awakened people than from governments, you know, you know, and I see Biden doing what he can. You know, I mentioned a lot of his signal accomplishments that were really trying to improve the the climate and the economy and help the nation restructure itself. Um, but, you know, politicians can only do so much because they have massive dark forces resisting them when they try to do helpful things. So uh, they can get some done, but it's up to us individuals to just wake up enough to get the inner guidance and then go into motion with what we can do uh, from our own level. And each of us has a unique assignment. So I hope that makes some kind of sense. See, Deb said, is foreign travel of a spiritual nature favorable in late October, or early November 24? Seems like her prediction would indicate so. When you're looking at that, it's always good to look at your own chart. See if your ninth house is getting good transits. The ninth house is the house of foreign travel. See if your natal Jupiter is getting lit up strongly. That's the planet of foreign travel. See if maybe transiting Jupiter in your chart is lighting something up. You know, it's good to have these big global perspectives, but if you're making a personal decision about stuff, I would always check out the natal chart also and uh, and get that perspective as well. Um, and of course, things in Sagittarius uh, would also relate to that theme. Uh, Lizzie says, if we in the Milky Way are only in 3D, where would we have to astro travel to bring in 4 or 5D? That's not how I conceive it, Lizzie. I believe I'm accessing 4 and 5D already, and I don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> and again, there's there's lots of approaches and techniques to bring in those consciousness. I like to keep it really simple, and my approach is just to invoke it. I'm a huge fan of invocations, and in the book that I wrote, Instant Divine Assistance, you can actually just do a custom invocation and just literally call in. I call in you know, 4 or 5D consciousness to the greatest extent that serves highest good and just relax. And by simply asking for it and then letting your higher self and your divine helpers bring it in as much as you can hold, 
In fact, we do uh, events in Awakening Plus. Uh, it's called 5D Immersion. Uh, we also have an Unconditional Love Immersion event that does a similar thing where we just um, get ourselves ready. We get into embodied awakening the best we can. And we ask for that kind of consciousness and relax and let it come in. Again, having been on the spiritual path 45 years um, and having spent decades doing, you know, ego-based high effort kind of stuff, uh, once I got clued in to the fact that you can simply ask your higher self and your divine allies to do these things for you, and they, in my experience, do it way better than the ego can, I've really shifted over to simply asking the divine to do it for me and letting it do it. And my actual experience with that has been that is way more effective than ego-based effort things. So that's just been my own experience. So that's what I would say, Lizzie. Just ask for the consciousness you want and relax and see what comes in your crown chakra. Brian says, very insightful and informative. Thank you, Benjamin, for all your energy, time, and effort. Lizzie says, so true. Out of the way, ego. <laughs> Sweet. I think that's Ted on Judy Figueroa's account has raised the hand. Uh, Ted, if you'd, oh, you're, you're actually unmuted. Yep. Please speak. I'd like to make an observation and get your reaction to it uh, with sure. regard to the uh, mini grand trine. Uh -huh. uh, one thing that that I've observed now, uh, you, you know, we we know that these these trine and sextile aspects, so called easy aspects. One characteristic of that is that it allows the energy between the planets to flow easily, not necessarily representing like high positive energy, you know, but just right. So one thing that, that I've observed is the Uranus-Neptune-Pluto connection in, in relation to the spread of misinformation mm -hmm. on these, on, on social medias. Uh -huh. You have Uranus representing the technolo technology. You have, you know, Pluto powering that and manipulating that and you have neptune projecting all kinds of illusions and delusions and you know so you have i think that that energy seems to be really manifesting indeed um, how can we we revert you know try to uh deal with that or reverse that well um again it's a very widespread thing and I'm not sure any one person can do much right, about it. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can choose to not engage with misinformation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and simply not dive into those uh, rabbit holes yourself. Again, this is a, one of those, what am I called to do things? Uh, my my own strategy is just avoid it. And it's not my theme to get up on a soapbox about. Mm -hmm. But some people are called to be advocates for it and to draw attention to to all this stuff, you know, last uh, last year I talked a lot about a book I had just read on this theme, and it really struck me as very powerful. Either disengage and don't get sucked into the negativity, or if you're being an advocate, you can choose to instead put out very uplifting and positive information on social media and act as a counterbalancing force. So again, each of us has to feel: What am I called to do? in that realm? Am I called to just withdraw entirely, be a more positive force, be an advocate for trying to get the social media companies to stop the stuff happening? You know, each of us just needs to feel, how am I called to engage with that, in my opinion? Is that a helpful answer? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if I can make a, another observation uh, sure. this, with, with regard to the, the, the Pluto return, um, I, I see the Pluto return as, you know, like, one thing that Pluto is associated with is deep trauma. And mm -hmm. the deep trauma oh, yeah. of this nation uh, has been, you know, the the deep trauma of in, of slavery and mm. also genocide. Yeah. Uh, and the the other thing that Pluto is associated with is the process of cleansing and rooting out the, uh, the, the, the the negativity and rebirthing into a more positive environment, you know, healing the trauma. And yeah. that, that's also a theme of Chiron. I see the nation being called upon to do that. Yes. But it doesn't seem to be passing the test. Well, I agree. I mean, there was some whole, I was really excited when the whole George Floyd thing really lit up the Black Lives Matter movement. I talked about that a lot more in my last two forecasts. Mm -hmm. It's real, very quiet now compared to before. 
and there was a strong upsurge of awareness. And, you know, some some states and cities are giving reparations to black people and Native Americans to try to make up for the terrible things that happened when white settlers spread across the country. Um, so there is some consciousness of that available. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. At the same time, there's been the massive backlash from the more conservative forces, you know, saying, no, whites need their rights, too. And, you know, coming back with the more um, controlling authoritarian kind of vibe again. So it's all there together, you know, and each of us just needs as I said, to decide where's my where's my action step? What is my intuition guiding me to step in? Where's my particular role in this? great realm of possibilities of how I could serve. That's Thank the only you. way. Yeah, it's the only way I can stay sane because there, there's so many issues crying for attention and only one me. <laughs> and we're all in that situation. So I just encourage people to relax and just really feel where am I called to serve and really just do the best service you can in that little narrow area where you can really make a difference. And no, like I said, there's lots of other light workers on the job too. Thank you, Benjamin. You're welcome. That, you made some great points there. I, I especially loved your point that even with a harmonious aspect pattern, the dark side can still spread smoothly around just like the light side can. That's so true. Gina said, I think it's important to remember everyone's journey is their own to truth, to awakening, et cetera. It must be their decision, their choice. I couldn't agree more. We are in a free will zone. Then Lori said, is there any planetary indication for alien disclosure and working with off-planet helpers? For example, the tall Nordic whites and the grays as referenced from Linda Moulton, How on Earth Files, which is on YouTube. Thank you, very informative. If there's a planetary uh, symbol for ETs and the kind of thing you're talking about, it would probably be Uranus, because Uranus rules high-tech technology, the, the really weird off-the-wall stuff, like most people consider this to be. If we take Uranus as representing ETs and all his harmonious connections, then it is not unrealistic to think there might be more information coming out about the ET contacts. You know, just personally in my own ceremonial work uh, on numerous occasions, I have in the inner worlds connected with benevolent ETs. And uh, in fact, just last month, I had a, an encounter like that in the inner realm. My experience is they're very much present. And of course, I'm sure there's light and dark, but the only ones I seem to be connecting with are the high vibration ones, because I guess that's the path I'm working. So, um, my experience in the inner world is there are a lot of ETs and extra dimensional beings helping us without having to physically manifest. And there are, of course, beings who are physical as well, but they definitely don't have to be in physical bodies to help out, in my experience. And of course, there's tons of disclosure already. It's amazing that, you know, the military is being so much more forthcoming now about having encountered UFOs or they're calling them something different now, but you know what I'm talking about. Deborah, would you like to speak? So I want to thank you very much. I love the idea, all the ideas that you put out is like, we can work on ourselves. We can bring, we can be the light and bring the energy and frequency to a higher level. And everyone should just check in with their own inner guidance and say, is this mine to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And if it's yours to do, it'll be very clear. And if it's not yours to do, then, you know, just keep on doing what you're doing is bringing and anchoring the light on this planet and transforming it. And I really love your perspective. And um, there was one other point that you mentioned that uh, you know, in working in the Akashic Records, I have found over a long periods of time that there were people that started out on the dark side, that that was a choice. And it was not such an easy choice for them to make mm -hmm. because they had to work through all that and, and become the light. Mm. It's easier to start out on the, on the, on uh, the light side. And, yeah. uh, but this is, this is a planet of choice. I believe so too. Yeah. So I wanted to say that I really resonate with what you said and uh, we have to make choices every day, all the time. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. So uh, Ted jumped in. Any thoughts on the April solar eclipse that will pass through the U.S.? Um, I did not look at that level. I just looked at the eclipse more broadly. When an eclipse actually, you know, is exact or really strong in a particular region, then that geographical region tends to feel the eclipse effects more potently than the other parts of the planet. I remember when we had the, uh, the exact eclipse of the sun that was visible um, in South Carolina. We drove down there and we had a big uh, event there. And to feel that that 
total eclipse happening was just extraordinary. The, the power of it was just visceral. So, uh, you know, eclipses really are major medicine when they get strong. Pamela says, forgot to ask if the discount is still available on personal astrology readings. If not, when might they be offered again? Uh, that special has passed, but um, there are still sliding scale available on hour and 90 minute readings. So you can still get a significant percentage off the price. So just go to astroshaman.com services and, and click astrologers in the pull down and you'll see you can um, save some money on those if you choose a 60 or 90 minute reading. So I encourage you to check that out, Pamela. Thanks. Cynthia said, my elder always said an eclipse is when God blinks and information comes through for humanity. I like that. It's beautiful. Ted. Okay. Just a uh, thank you, ben Benjamin. That that really was uh, an excellent presentation, as always. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thanks again for having me, Ted. And uh, super grateful to everyone who showed up here, everyone who's watching it on the recording afterwards. Uh, big blessings to one and all. And may we all help to make this country and this planet more awesome. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.